atop Caesar Rodney Square in historic Wilmington, Delaware, we are the Podcast Pediatricians. I'm Rob Walter. And I'm Matt Gotthold. Find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, and on our website, podcastpediatricians.com. We've gotten many great episode ideas and suggestions from you, the listeners, on our site. So please keep giving ideas and sign up for extra bonus features there by leaving your email. And Matty Ice, we last week blew past 10,000 downloads. Woohoo! And if you like this podcast, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your colleagues. Now, a lot has happened since our last podcast. We plan to do pets next, and that's coming soon. But then the biggest flu epidemic in our careers hit our area and hit it hard. So we had to discuss influenza. And Matt, we were talking a few weeks ago that ah, it's not so bad this year. A lot of flu warnings. It seemed pretty tame. And then just like, wham. Yes. It's been gruesome. <laughs> it knocks over. It hit us hard like Malcolm Jenkins. Yeah, man. Boom. In the Super Bowl. And I am vexed by the flu this year more than any other, Matthias. I'm just vexed. I was on call last weekend. It was brutal. Worst I've seen in over 30 years of pediatrician, but all the different issues we'll get into about testing and treatment and Tamiflu and prophylaxis, it's just really hard. Did you, you say 30 years? <laughs> you, you, you are old. All right. As of February 9th, at least 84 American children have died of the flu. Likely, less than a quarter of these children got flu shots based on previous year's statistics. This is horrible. When this year's flu shot is 51% effective against the deadly influenza H3N2 in children, and, f- and a flu shot in a healthy child reduces the risk of death by flu by 65%. 65%. 65%. 65% in healthy children. In our state of Delaware, there were 995 flu cases last week, shattering the old record and six deaths overall, all were in adults. And these are just a fraction of the likely total cases we'll have this flu season. Again, most of the severe flu illnesses are influenza A, H3N2 strains, notoriously the nastiest of the flu strains. But this year, influenza A plus B hit together. Awful. One-two punch. So far this year, hospitalizations for the flu are at the highest level ever. It's hit almost every state. You know, they're... They're running out of IV fluid in many yeah, hospitals. Is that crazy or what? It is. What? Now, part of that's because of the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. which manufactured a lot. And that's a whole other issue. And it's not over. But good news. The CDC just a few days ago released figures indicating that flu rates finally seem to have plateaued. I hope so. Now, every year, 9 to 36 million Americans get ill with the flu and somewhere between 100,000 to 710,000 of them are hospitalized. And again, 12 to 56,000 Americans die each year from the flu. This year, it may get up to 60,000 deaths when all said and done. Even worse than the last influenza A, H2N2 flu epidemic in 2014 and 2015, when a total of 148 kids died. By some reports, over 3,500 Americans per week were dying from the flu, at its peak this month. Again, most of these deaths are in people with chronic illnesses and or in the elderly. Yet, only 60% of kids under 18 in the United States get a flu shot. And only 40% of adults in the United States get a flu shot. And actually, those percentages have been falling every year. Wow. This is not good. So we're going to take a break for just a second and remind you that we are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. Hey, Matt, do you know who else was battling the flu last Sunday, February 4th? The... I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Nelson Aguilar. And the singer Pink at the Super Bowl. You mean Nelson Aguilar, that stellar wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles, a.k.a. Super Bowl champions? Yes, the same one they almost cut last year because he kind of sucked. Well, he did suck He came back. (laughs) But Nelson and Pink fought through it, just like our Eagles. And yes, the podcast pediatricians were live at the Super Bowl and at the parade. And we're going to spare you our singing and Eagles blather for now. But if you want, keep listening at the end of the podcast for our Super Bowl 52 recap. But first, 
a plug from our very first sponsor. Now, we know our audience is a nice mix of pediatric caregivers and parents. And it's important to us that any sponsor we have is a product that we use and wholeheartedly endorse. Sometimes it will be for products for everyone, and sometimes it will be more geared to parents or to the pediatric caregivers. Our very first sponsor is geared to pediatric caregivers. All right, Matt, what's the worst part of pediatric practice? Oh, I can answer this in a heartbeat. It's taking call. Uh, And the worst time to get a call? (sighs) Overnight, man. Anytime after like 11 o'clock or so. Man, it just wrecks me. When I'm in a deep sleep and I get that call, I never can get back to sleep. I just have back pain the next day. It's awful. <laughs> Taking calls gives you back pain, huh? <laughs> well, I can tell you what. I never really realized the, ter- the, the the import of the term cuts right through me until I've been woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning so many times with that, with that pager or phone going off. And 20, 25 years ago, it was easier. It's yeah. not as easy now. Yeah. So and, what do you do about that? Well, you know, originally when I started the first year in private practice, the Children's Hospital gave us a service really cheap. And then they snatched it away. And for years, I've done nothing about it. And obviously, we're not lawyers. We don't get paid for it either when we get woken up in the middle of the night. And then a few years ago, I just told my partners, I got to find something. And I researched and I researched. And I couldn't find anybody that wasn't obscenely expensive or was non-flexible or didn't have quality service until our colleague, Dr. Amy, turned me on to Julie at Triage for Pediatrics. Yeah. Julie has been the answer to my prayers. You just started not too long ago after after I was telling you how great it was for the past year. Yes. Mm-hmm. And what do you think? I think it's awesome. You know, what uh, what Triage for Pediatrics does for us is it takes our calls, answers in a very professional manner. They use Barton Schmidt protocols. And to date, all of my patients have been very happy with the service. And if my patients are happy, I'm happy. That makes for a great day in the morning when I come in. I can review the the, um, the messages that were taken and the actions that were taken by Triage for Pediatrics, and I couldn't be happier with their service. Yeah, it's been really, it's been a game changer for us. Julie is a long-term pediatric nurse, been doing this for over 25 years, has a large staff of pediatric registered nurses using protocols, and she now serves over 600 pediatric providers from small solo practices to group practices to two large provider systems throughout the country. She's in 29 states now, and that's growing pretty much each year. And again, she really can customize it for your needs. So whether you want to have a service just overnight, which I usually use, or as Dr. Amy uses almost all the time when she's off, and she actually uses them as an answering service, she can do all of those things. And you give her the details of customization, even per doctor, what kind of calls, Tell them when you want them to call the ER, when you want them to call you. And as you said, our patients, it's been seamless. Our patients really, really like it. And we get that fax in the morning. We call them back if there's any issues, and we just scan it right into the EMR. It's a beautiful thing, Rob. And actually, in the past year, I've been woken up once in the middle of the night, and it was very appropriate. So I go to bed now thinking, I'm probably going to good night's sleep. And that makes all the difference. So again, triage for pediatrics, including Delaware, Maryland, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas. If you're interested, call Julie at 214-450-5030 or email her at jortiz at triageforpediatrics.com. That's J-O-R-T-I-Z at T-R-I-A-G-E, the number four, then pediatrics.com. No spaces. Again, the phone number is 214-450-5030. 5030, mention podcast pediatricians, and you'll get a really, really, really good discount. Really? (laughs) Really. Okay, we're going to jump right in, but first, I like the tradition of a little snack, so guess what time of year it is, Matt? Winter? (laughs) Girl Scout cookie time of year, and I knew that because I went to the local Acme and got accosted by multiple (laughs) Girl Scouts, and I usually will probably buy some but you've been there right when they go you're my doctor and then oh, yeah. forget it you gotta buy girls got i'm sorry do you guys take debit cards <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt that does, gets me right off the hook Matt man. Does not carry cash. until they start start carrying those little square devices i'm good to go all right you've got your choice here you've got the samoas one mm-hmm. of my favorites i love coconut or nice. you have the newer toffee tastic <laughs> what do you want 
I think I'm going to go toffee tastic today. Toffee tastic. You know, for the fact that we have great intentions of talking about good nutrition and we continue to eat, <laughs> eat nutritionally void well, snacks on this show, it's there's for a Girl little Scouts. irony there. It's for Girl Scouts. Is it? Oh, I think Girl right. Scouts should start ca- selling carrots, perhaps. How is it? Is it toffee-tastic? It's toffee-licious. Mm. It tastes kind of like a pecan candy, tandy. Where, where is pecan, you know, those things? Sandy. Pecan it sandy. It tastes like pecan sandies. But better. I love those. It's a little crunchier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Back Very to flu, good. Matt. All right. Let's talk some flu. So the flu is mostly in winter months in temperate climates, and it generally starts in October or November and peaks in February and usually fades by March or April. The influenza virus continually changes with antigenic shifts or drifts of its surface proteins named hemagglutinin or H or noraminidase or N. The CDC and the World Health Organization continually monitor the shifts of the flu around the world. The worst flus are usually variants of the influenza A, strains H3N2 and H1N1. And influenza B can also be bad, but not as bad as A, usually. And again, this year they hit together. Now, our egg-based vaccine we use now are just not good enough to provide longer protection as the virus changes each year. That's why you need a new vaccine each year. Two issues. One is that it's egg-based, and that's really prone to shortages in manufacturing. So hopefully soon, the newer cell-based flu vaccines will be more available, which will end the shortages. But the holy grail of flu vaccine is finding a universal flu vaccine that protects you for multiple years, despite the various mutations of the flu virus. It would need to be based on the parts of the virus that don't change each year. So it will work for years and years. And honestly, Matt, it's a national scandal how little our country puts in to preventing epidemics like the flu. Most years, the flu costs the national economy over $87 billion. Billion. Billion is a thousand millions. You know that? Thank you. He learned that in (laughs) South Jersey. I did. This year, it will surely be much more. The current administration is cutting back on investing in preparing and preventing flu epidemics. The search for a universal flu vaccine is really obscenely underfunded. There someday will be another catastrophic flu pandemic, just like 100 years ago in 1918, where the Spanish flu killed 50 to 100 million people. It's called Spanish flu, but we're history buffs. But it really started probably in Kansas or some people say China, but they blame it on Spain. But anyway, on this 100th anniversary of that catastrophe and this bad flu season, hopefully it'll be a wake-up call to start looking for a better flu vaccine. Yeah, the flu, the flu virus is transmitted from person to person by respiratory secretions. This means by coughing, by sneezing, by talking, by touching or contaminated objects like waiting room toys. The incubation period is one to four days with a mean of about two days. So, if you're not sick four days after contact with the flu, you're likely out of the woods. Influenza B spreads rapidly with high transmittability. Which is why, during especially the flu season, we all need to do the fist bump. Not buying it. One-fifth of the germs. It's un-American. If you care about your patients and your families Mm. out there, start all doing the fist bump. I wash my hands, Rob. (laughs) All right. Viral shedding peaks at 24 to 48 hours after the illness is onset and stops after five to 10 days. But it can be longer in children than in adults. A rule of thumb is that the flu is contagious 24 hours before symptoms start and 24 hours after the last fever. Say it again, Matt. That's the key. A rule of thumb is that the flu is contagious for 24 hours before the symptoms start and 24 hours after the last fever. Nice. Normally, the flu infects around 9% of children per year, but can go up to as high as 20 to 30% of children in an epidemic year like this one. The hospitalization rate for children is highest in those who are under 5. High-risk pediatric populations for flu, which is so important for the guidelines and who we should consider treating for the flu and prophylaxing for the flu with Tamiflu, and again, more on that later, these high-risk populations include children under age five and especially under age two. But if you include under age five, that's a lot of children. And the highest rates of hospitalization and mortality are actually 
in those children under six months of age, especially. High-risk populations also include all, all, all adults 65 years of age and older. And also high-risk children and adults include those with asthma and chronic lung disease, heart disease, kidney and liver disorders, blood disorders like sickle cell, hormone disorders, especially diabetes, metabolic disorders, and all kids and adults with neurologic and neurodevelopmental conditions, including brain disorders, spinal cord disorders, seizures, and intellectual disabilities, and those immunosuppressed, and also those who are extremely overweight, also Native Americans and Native Alaskans, and anyone who's living in a long-term facility. And although pediatric deaths are much more likely in children who have one of those high-risk conditions, about 40% of all pediatric flu deaths occur in children with no high-risk conditions at all. And Matt, that's the really scary part. So what does what exactly does flu mean? What does flu involve from a clinical standpoint? So the symptoms can vary broadly, but classically symptoms of uncomplicated flu infection include things like abrupt onset of fever, headaches, myalgias, which are muscle pains, and malaise or fatigue. And these are accompanied by manifestations of respiratory illness such as cough, sore throat, and rhinitis or runny nose. This is so bad that even your eyes hurt. Yeah, you know, that's like the classic thing when they have all these other things that my eyes just hurt. Moving around, my eyes hurt. Like, ah, uh, that sounds yeah, like the flu. Yeah, the flu. Yeah. So fever occurs in about 95% of flu patients, and over half of those fevers are above the 102 mark. Yeah, so for us, when someone thinks they have the flu and there's no fever, it's really unlikely that it's truly the flu. So you yeah. really need the fever if it's going to be likely you have the influenza. Yeah, a lot of the symptoms are, are real common and kind of known to everyone out there. But just to review, cough is present in about 77% of those with flu, clear runny noses or rhinorrhea in about 78%, headache in a quarter of kids, especially older kids with flu. About 7% get muscle aches, although I would argue that it's higher than that even, but that's just what the stats say. In fact, to me, muscle aches is just pathognomonic of the flu. You know, right. If you're, if you're achy. achy, if you've got a fever, you know, more likely than not, you have the flu, particularly at this time of season. Right. And if you have those calf pain, specific mm-hmm. calf pain, that's a specific influenza B thing. But yeah. just the overall achiness is all flu. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's really severe, it can go as far as causing myoglobinuria and possibly kidney failure. Have you ever seen that one, Rob? I have not. I saw some really bad calf pains back in Chicago in the 80s. No one with myoglobinuria. Although, as we said in a past podcast, the most common cause of myoglobinuria is spin classes. It's those soul cycle and flywheel people that are getting myoglobinuria. Are you one of those people? Um, I can't. I'm, I will not answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't get myoglobinuria in Tai Chi, by the way. So come back to the class. You don't get much of anything. Master Gene misses you. (laughs) I failed that class. He got kicked out. Now, in younger kids, the classic symptoms may be somewhat absent, but they have higher fevers, even febrile seizures in these young kids with flu, and they have less respiratory problems, but much more GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and poor appetite. In many of these young kids, it just might be fever and malaise. Sometimes they're breathing a little fast, a little redness of the eyes, some increased nodes in the neck, and sometimes with a sore throat, but it doesn't look like classic strep. So don't get strep tests on every kid who looks like they have a flu and their throat is a little bit red. It's a waste of time and likely can lead to overtreatment. Please reference strep episode. Now, the flu is usually an acute, self-limited, uncomplicated disease, and kids usually improve gradually over about a week with or without antiviral therapy, but some symptoms like the cough can last for weeks. So can the tiredness, and we're seeing that, just tired for a week or two after getting the flu. And a child can get one type of flu, like A, in a season, and then later the same season get another type of flu, like B. That's why the flu shot is recommended even if a child or even an adult has already had the flu that season. Common complications of the flu include ear infections in 10 to 50%. We usually see that three to four days after the flu symptoms start. But the biggie and worst complication of influenza is pneumonia, especially in those high-risk kids, including those under two years of age. The virus can cause pneumonia itself, but the worst pneumonia is often the secondary bacterial pneumonia, especially strep pneumoniae, and worst of all, staph aureus. 
this can and does kill. So the flu can also make asthma worse and by itself lead to respiratory failure. It's actually associated with croup, and I've seen a few cases of croup this flu season and usually don't think of the flu, but likely some of them are the flu. In those nasty secondary bacterial infections, often the child will seem to get better for a few days, and then fever and illness come roaring back a week or so after the flu-like illness. So you have, a, have to be really vigilant about bacterial pneumonia and sepsis in terms of your consideration as a pediatrician. It's always scary when a child gets better and then suddenly gets worse again. In everything, right? Anytime you hear they were good and then they got sick again, you're like, "Uh uh-oh. It's like bacterial tracheitis after croup. Oh, terrible. It's always they get better and then they get worse. Yeah. Central nervous system complications like Guillain-Barre, ataxia, aseptic meningitis, and encephalitis are thankfully not very common, but they do occur. Remember the association with Rye syndrome when when it used to be uh, that people were given aspirin routinely when they were kids back in the day? You remember that? I do remember that, mid-80s. Now, I don't know if you saw that. You were at uh, the closed medical school. What's it called again? (laughs) Hahnemann, it's gone. But in Chicago in the mid-80s, I mean, we were as a medical student seeing quite a bit of Rye syndrome before they realized that the aspirin was the key to avoid to when you have flu not to get Rye syndrome. Yeah. And it happened around the same time. I don't know if you knew this, but there was this big Tylenol tampering issue in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So we had kids with Rye syndrome, and then we had kids poisoned with Tylenol, so... No one was using aspirin. Everyone was scared about Tylenol. So yeah. who made out? Advil and Motrin. Oh, they yeah. just took over. Oh, like banshees. Yeah, I remember when, when I was younger, my mom used to have a lot of, um, she used to have a bottle of St. Joseph's aspirin. And St. Joseph's aspirin, to me, tasted like a creamsicle. So, <laughs> so I would always say that something hurt. And to be honest with you, when she ducked out of the kitchen, I'd down like seven or eight of those babies. <laughs> God knows what my liver looked like back in the 70s. Oh, it was probably <laughs> awful. <laughs> So influenza-related myocarditis, or heart inflammation, or pericarditis, is uncommon, but it can be severe, especially in influenza A, H1N1. Okay, let's move to testing for the flu. Now remember again that laboratory confirmation of influenza is not necessary, not necessary, before the initiation of antiviral therapy or prophylaxis, and it should not delay the initiation of therapy when indicated. I have been doing a little bit more testing this year. How about you? Yeah, so <laughs> I've got to be honest. My practice is a little dichotomized on this one. So so I we have two offices. Schizophrenic? Oh, something Some like that. Some would say schizophrenic. So, okay. so we have flu testing, or at least we did until recently, at one of our offices, but not at the other. And most of that was a, in preference to the the physicians who work at those offices. Those of us who are more old school in, in my Wilmington, um, Delaware office, you know, tend to, tend to base our diagnoses on more, uh, you know, clinical acumen. Whereas the office in the South is a more, uh, oh, uh, progressive office in terms of the testing that we do. Or and perhaps so the, less clinical acumen. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> With Dr. J. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those guys are awesome. But it, so in that case, we've actually, uh, experienced both sides of the coin. So, so I will say that in certain cases it is valuable to have a flu testing, um, possibility available to you. Uh, I frankly have never used it all that much, but, uh, but it can come in handy at certain times. Now, the best test for influenza are the molecular assays, including PCR. There's also something called antigen-detecting assays, but they're just not as sensitive, so we're going to ignore them. Now, these molecular assays, like the RT-PCR, look at influenza A and B and take one to eight hours to do, and it's what our children's hospital does, and it costs about 200 bucks, and we have not done it in the office, so we send them out there to get it done stat at the children's hospital. You can also get a full respiratory panel that looks at parainfluenza virus and RSV, and that can cost about 400 bucks. One fun fact about testing for flu, if you've recently gotten a flu shot, your flu test can be positive in your nasal pharyngeal swab because of viral shedding from the flu shot, which peaks about three days after the shot, but can be seen up to seven to 10 days. So beware of a false positive flu test if you test someone who just got the flu shot. But the big thing now, and I think what you have in one of your offices, Matt, is the rapid molecular assays that take less than 20 minutes and can distinguish between influenza A and B, although it doesn't really matter for us, I think, which one it is, and has a sensitivity from 86 to 90%. There are two clear-waved rapid flu tests we can use in our office, 
And one recent analysis in children and adults showed a sensitivity of 92% up to 95%. And most importantly, a specificity of over 99% for both influenza A and B. So if it does come back positive, you can absolutely trust it. And this test costs about $20 to $25, although many show it's more cost effective to just empirically treat, as you said. I guess the question that comes up is you sometimes will just empirically treat, but if you're going to base your decision to treat and then prophylax multiple, multiple members of that patient's family like grandma and grandpa and a four-month-old sibling and giving them Tamiflu and risking side effects and all that cost, do you want to do all that based on just your clinical suspicion or do you feel better and will the patients feel better and the family feel better to say, we prove that's what you have before we give everybody all this medication. What do you think? Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of Tamiflu. You know, we, uh, I use it in rare instances. I use it usually in the high risk patients. And those are the same people that I would probably use the testing for as well if it were at my fingertips. So children who are under two, children who have high risk situations like asthma, diabetes, uh, immune deficiencies, et cetera, they're the ones that I'm really most interested in terms of treating for the flu. You know, if indeed the Tamiflu is at all helpful, and I think sometimes that can be a gambit because, you know, sources on that vary, although the consensus seems to be that it can be somewhat helpful, I am not entirely convinced. And so, I mean, I'm not sure what the take is from from your standpoint on that. Mm -hmm. Good question, Matt. And Mm -hmm. after the break... We will delve into Tamiflu, yes or no. Oh, you're going to wait, make me wait until the break? Yep, we'll be right back. Oh. back. Okay, so Matt, a Dr. Sergio Canavero of Italy announced a few weeks ago, and I'm sure you heard about this, that he would soon perform the world's first human head transplant in China, and he castigated the medical communities in the United States and Europe for not supporting this controversial procedure. Yes, because there's absolutely no ethical <laughs> issues brought up about doing a head transplant. Which is why he's doing it in some cave in China. <laughs> now, the donor will be a healthy body of a brain-dead patient in China, matched for build with the recipient's disease-free head. Like, what does that mean, match for build? He was a big guy, <laughs> so I kind of need a big head. <laughs> you don't want it to be like a Peanuts character with a little body and a huge head. God forbid we match them, I don't know, immunologically, like <laughs> by HLA, you know, anything that would seem more scientific. We just need a guy about this size, you know, to do a head transplant. And I know you like Frankenstein, so I thought you were going to bring that up. And the Mary Shelley. <laughs> Yeah, Mary Shelley, it's never been done better. Doctor, what was this guy's name? Dr. Canavero. <laughs> Dr. Canavero, it's been done better and more literal, <laughs> literally or, or, or with greater literary value. Except, uh, of course. By Mary Shelley. Except, of course, in for Dr. Canavero, both the head and the body will be alive. They won't be putting together dead pieces to make a live person. Oh, God. Now, this what's, pre- what's the matter? Is, is Ted Williams busy? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on with him? Now, the procedure will likely cost up to $100 million and involve several dozen surgeons and other specialists. They will simultaneously sever the spinal cords of the donor and the recipient with a Diamond blade and all. Oh, that makes it better. They all talk about the diamond blade. I don't know what that means. And then they'll bathe the ends of the nerves in a solution, stabilize the membranes, and then put them back together. They will be fused, but will not regrow. What are they bathing the ends of the nerves in? You know, I have no idea. But (laughs) it's like special sauce. (laughs) They can't tell you what it is. Uh, (laughs) No, and you know, one of the things I thought of was like. Okay, they're getting the bodies from China, these these bodies put together. Is it gonna be like from the Body Works exhibit that yeah. came to the to came to the Franklin Institute last year? Are you gonna be able mm-hmm. to see their muscles? Oh I know that's kinda of gross, but that'd be freaky. I thought about that. Now, to protect the recipient's brain from immediate death before it's attached to its new body, it will be cooled to a state of deep hypothermia. And last year, Matt, 
at MIT, a scientist did freeze the brain of a rabbit and then reanimated it and it worked again. So there is some precedence. Of course, many physicians and scientists feel that patients will be better served if they focused their efforts on spinal cord reconstruction, not head plants. But my <laughs> Is first... that what they're called? Head plants? <laughs> head transplants. <laughs> head plants. But my first thought, which I think was what you kind of mouthed to me, was... I had a head plant, but now I'm a vegetable. <laughs> who, are you thinking of, who do you think of with like taking a frozen head? Who do you think of? I, 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 I think I mentioned him a second ago. Ted Williams. Ted Williams. Yeah. Ted Williams, whose head is frozen with 144 other people's heads or whole bodies in Scottsdale, Arizona, because you're going to freeze a head, why not go to Scottsdale, Arizona? It's a way to do it. So Ted Williams, for those of you listeners who are not familiar with the name, (laughs) was a perennial all-star hitter for the Boston Red Sox. Last player to hit over 400? Yeah, he played when? In the 40s and 50s? 40s, 50s. He overlapped with DiMaggio, and he was a better pure hitter. But the one thing that's just sad is that, of course, the Red Sox never won a world championship. And I I have this this vision in my mind that they transplant his head. He wakes up, and then he finds out that since he died, the Red Sox won three World Series championships, and then his head explodes. (laughs) (laughs) Either that or he says, his head says, hey, can you find me the right body type? (laughs) Because I want in on this. So, which leads me to the last question, Matt. Do you want to have your head cryogenically frozen? No, no, please God, no. No. (laughs) I think we both got nothing more to contribute to society than this podcast. I think we both might have considered it, but then the Mm -hmm. Eagles won the Super Bowl, so Uh, we can die happy without freezing our head. Exactly right. I'm complete now. (laughs) We'll be right back. Okay, we're back, and we'll get to that Tamiflu controversy. But first, Matt, tell us about some flu shot news. Okay, so flu shots. As our listeners know, flu shots are abundantly available, generally anywhere from the end of the summer into the fall. And as time goes on, there's less of an opportunity for us to offer these to our patients. And so now, with the current flu epidemic going on, it's really frustrating uh, when parents who initially refuse the flu vaccines are calling our offices and sadly asking for things that we don't have anymore. So we're really, we've, we're running out or we've run out over the last several days or so. I don't know if you guys see this in your office as well, Rob. Absolutely. We're running out too. And it's also frustrating because you know next year, a lot of those same parents, when we're telling them in September, you should get it, they'll say, well, yeah. I don't know. I don't believe in the flu shot. Yeah, I, don't I don't even know what toxins. that means. What does that mean? I don't believe in I don't in believe in vaccine. peanut butter. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I, 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 it, it, it boggles my mind. I mean, one thing, and we're going to come back to this again when we speak about various other things, most importantly, vaccines, is it's difficult for me to understand sometimes when parents are seeking our advice that's been based on years of practice and hopefully years of research on our own parts on advice along the lines of vaccinations, in this case, flu vaccines, knowing full well that we have our own children get the flu vaccines when they were this age and asking what we think. Well, what do you think I think? I give it to my own child, you know? And so in that context, it's a little bit frustrating for us to then have to confront the, uh, the issues and complications that come out of people who have decided not to um, take our advice on this. Again, it's a free country. I completely understand that. But um, it's a choice that's made and oftentimes based on anecdotes and, and misinformation that are propagated on the Internet. Right. How do you respond to someone who says, I've done my research and you kind of say, like, well, what where? does that mean? <laughs> what did you right. research? You've done your research, but Rob and I have been practicing for over 25 years each. What more research do Rob and I need? Right. You know, right. Uh, again, not to toot our own horns, but when you practice pediatrics, you've seen most of these gruesome things and oftentimes not good results, you know, from the standpoint of some of these infectious diseases. And so as far as I'm concerned, when I'm offering the flu vaccine, although it's a parent's choice, I'm really encouraging them, I'm urging them to consider that this is a very protective thing potentially for their child's health. Amen. And you know what? Let's at this point give a moment of silence for the nasal flu vaccine or flu mist that's been pulled from our market because it was just so ineffective. It was about as effective as using plain salt water when they studied it the last two years, but our kids really miss it. It was unfortunate because they say, I'll just get the nasal flu, and they get really disappointed, and it gets harder sometimes to get them to get the flu shot. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC recommend annual flu vaccines for everybody over six months of age. Say that again. The American Academy of Pediatrics <laughs> and the CDC recommend annual flu vaccines for everybody over six months of age. Everyone. Yep. It's a relatively well-known fact that in order to formulate the flu vaccine, a group of scientists essentially take an educated guess as to which strains are coming around the world toward the U.S. and formulate the flu based on this. Sometimes they don't guess very well. We now use mostly quadrivalent flu vaccines with two A strains and two B strains. It did include an influenza A H3N2 strain and an H1N1 strain this year, but the match still was not great. Most of us don't use the multi-dose vials anymore that had thimerosal. The trivalent vaccine has three strains, does not have one of the B strains, but does have the same important A strains, and so is a good alternative if you cannot get quadrivalent. Did you use it this year, Rob? We actually did. When we started to get real low in supplies, all we can get was the trivalent, and we've been using that and mixing in some of the quadrivalent. But again, as you have said, our supplies are almost out. And again, the one thing about the trivalent is that you can't use it from age three to four. It's only for four and up, so you have that one little gap of age. Now remember, the first season that you ever get a flu shot, hopefully it's when you're in infancy, but even up to age eight, if it's your first time getting it, you should get two flu shots at least a month apart. And then for the rest of your life, you only need one flu shot a year. And remember, we use a lower dose of 0.25 for under three and 0.5 for three and over. And you can give the flu vaccine to kids even if they have a mild fever and illness. You do not need to wait for well visits. So I think Matt and I, both of us, during the fall, took every opportunity, even during sick visits, if they didn't have a high acute fever, to say, hey, did you get the flu shot? Let's just give you the flu shot now because they're in the office. You might as well just give it and not wait for them to come in later because they may not come in later or you may run out. One big change is that now you can get the flu vaccine even if you're allergic to eggs, if it's just hives. You can do it in the office and not even wait 30 minutes. If the egg vaccine reaction is more severe than that, then it should be done in a medical setting, but still it can be done. We usually defer this to the allergist's office, but subsequently, they often will just tell us to go ahead and give it in our offices and watch the patient for 20 minutes. Rob, have you ever had any severe reactions from that? I have not. Have no, you? Nor have I. No, which is probably why now it's legit for us to give egg allergic patients the flu vaccine in our offices. Remember, we used to be told that if they were on steroids, then they couldn't get the flu, va flu vaccine. But if it's less than two weeks of steroids, then it's legit to give it. The most common side effect of the flu shot of the, is the local reaction at the injection site, just like every other vaccine that we give. And sometimes a bit of fever, especially if the child is very young, and that's usually within just the first 24 hours. So, okay. Then, months ago, we started hearing in the media that the flu shot was only 10 to 17% effective against the flu. So our parents were like, why well, get it? Well, first of all, 10 to 17% was not accurate at all. It turns out that this year's flu vaccine is overall 36% effective against all flu strains and 25% effective on that nasty H2N3 strain. But in kids, it's a much better story. Overall, it's 59% effective in that H3N2 strain and 51% effective against H1N1 in kids. This is a wonderful surprise. This is the first year that I started thinking, you know, the CDC and the media need to stop reporting early on about how ineffective the flu vaccine is because it just drives people not to get the flu vaccine until it's too late. And they really don't know how it's going to end up being for the whole season. And less people get the flu vaccine and then more people die. Yeah, all they're re really reporting is to that point of the flu season, exactly. the efficacy of it. As we know, the flu can shift throughout the season. It can have a bimodal presentation being earlier in, for instance, the, the fall, and then later in the early spring. And by the time that um, it gets to certain populations, the efficacy could well be much higher you know, than what's currently reported. So I, I agree with you, Rob. I think that that's a little bit counterproductive to be reporting the efficacy of it. You know, what most people don't realize is no vaccine is 100% effective. You know, what we're really relying on largely is the efficacy that it has combined with the fact that many people are getting it. And that's what yields a lot of good result. Right. You're trying to reduce risk. And even if you get the flu after you get a flu shot, 
it may often be a lot less severe. Again, you're reducing risk, not eliminating it. The flu shot is overwhelmingly a smart idea, as outlined by our old Hoosier friend, Dr. Aaron Carroll, in the New York Times a few weeks ago. As he pointed out, in a good vaccine year, the number of people needed to be vaccinated to help one person not get the flu is 37. In years when it's not so effective, that number can be as high as 77. But even if it takes 100 people to be vaccinated to prevent one person from getting severe flu, it's worth it in our populations of hundreds of millions of people. And get this, in a 2016 Cochrane review, it showed that the number of children six years or younger needed to be vaccinated to help one person not get severe flu is only six children. An amazing payoff in medical terms to prevent deaths in children and adults. And the well-known secret of kid flu shots is that immunizing kids is the best way to reduce tens of thousands of flu deaths each year in the elderly. Flu shots for little Haley can save mom, mom, and pop, pop's life. The other high-risk person in the family is mom, especially the year after she gives birth, because having a baby sucks her immune system dry. Biology is all about the next generation. And there's no significant downsides to getting the flu shot. Side effects are extremely, extremely rare. All right, one last comment on flu vaccine for kids. Again, the flu shot reduces the chance that your child will die from the flu. It reduces the risk of death from the flu by 65% in healthy children and 51% in children in high-risk populations. And this is a study from Pediatrics in 2017. Okay, prevention and treatment of the flu with antiviral drugs. But Matt, let's just make clear that the main treatment for flu is rest and fluids and, of course, chicken soup, preferably made in a pot, not from a can. Okay. There are three flu drug neuraminidase inhibitors out there, but basically the only one that we use is Alstiltamivir, or the branded name of Tamiflu. It's available as generic in pills, which is what we use, but for the liquid, I think it's only available in the brand name. The most common side effects are GI, and that occurs in about 15% of the population, over placebo GI effects of about 8%. Mostly it's nausea and vomiting. Sometimes Tamiflu can cause a rash, and sometimes in very rare cases, there's a major rash reaction called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But luckily, again, that's rare. I think the biggest scary side effect is the possible neuropsychiatric effects of things like delirium, hallucinations, confusion, and abnormal behavior, convulsions, and encephalitis. This can come on abruptly, and it usually ends abruptly when the medication is stopped. Now, Matt, you were the one at the parade, but it looked like a lot of Eagle fans there might have been suffering from neuropsychiatric Tamiflu side effects. What do you think? <laughs> they were certainly suffering from delirium. <laughs> I'm not sure I can vouch for any of the other things. <laughs> I, could, I could not find any incidents of these reactions, but did see that in March 2007 in Japan, where they used Tamiflu like water at the time, they had a couple of teenage suicides while the children were on Tamiflu, and the Japanese advised against using it in adolescents from 10 to 19 years of age. Many feel it's unclear whether Tamiflu actually is causing these side effects. It could potentially be the flu virus itself. Have you ever seen any neuropsychiatric effects, Rob? You know, I have never seen neuropsychiatric side effects from Tamiflu. How about you? I have, yeah. I had a handful of adolescents, and this was probably four or five years ago, and this is one of the reasons that I take pause a bit when it comes to prescribing Tamiflu, who actually did suffer some uh, some hallucinations. They suffered from some uh, just weird behavior, uh, and it did indeed mitigate as soon as we took them off of the Tamiflu. That's what I've read, is that as soon as you get off, you stop it, it goes away. Yeah. Now, the CDC recommends antiviral treatment for the flu for anyone sick enough to be hospitalized. No argument there, right, man? If they're in the hospital, treat them. I can go with that. Plus, anyone in the high-risk group, which can include all kids under age 5, even if the highest risk is under age 2. And again, that's a lot of kids. Now, treating the flu with Tamiflu seems to shorten the clinical illness by about a day if you start it within two days of the onset of flu. But, and this is what I learned doing some research on this, which gave me pause. Some studies show that if you start Tamiflu within 12 hours of the onset of illness, 
in young children, it can shorten the duration of illness by up to three days. And that's great because the youngest children are the ones who have the highest incidence of complication. But, Matteo, does that mean we should give Tamiflu to every young child having a fever during the first 12 hours in the flu season? Especially if that child has a young infant brother or a sibling with asthma? That's why it seems so vexing to me about when do you make that call? Yeah, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the debate still rages in terms of the value of Tamiflu. Now, if what you're saying is true, if it can be pr proven in large population studies, that indeed if this medication is initiated within the first 12 hours or so of illness, then we as practitioners and the research community needs to find better and more rapid ways of diagnosing the flu so that we can hop right on this. Now, what Tamiflu had originally advertised itself as being was being able to decrease the course of flu by somewhere between 18 and 24 hours, if I'm correct, correct. right? Correct, correct. Which to me is, you know, is that actually worth the side effects, number one? And there was some contention a few years ago, although it's been countered since then, by the Cochrane Reviews, in which case it was questioned as to whether or not Tamiflu actually worked at all, at least to any great benefit. So I got to tell you, I'm very dubious about this whole Tamiflu efficacy. And until larger scale studies are done, I still hesitate to use it except for in the highest risk, risk populations. I agree, but it's tough when the CDC throws these guidelines out and who really adheres to them the most? The urgent care centers. Exactly. So they're throwing Tamiflu out to everyone. It's telling the parents it's the CDC guidelines. And I don't know about you, and usually... I go by what I think is the most important thing, not necessarily the parents' wishes, mm -hmm. but more and more this season, if I have a child in the office and think the child probably has the flu and wouldn't normally give Tamiflu, if a parent is, says, I really want the Tamiflu, I've heard that it can be more effective early on, and that's what the CDC says or that's what the urgent care says, more and more this season, I was saying, okay, we'll give it. And that's why I've used Tamiflu a lot more this year than I have in the past. Have you? Yeah, I mean, the CDC carries some weight there. I think uh, urgent care, as we've discussed in the past, carries zero, zero weight, weight with me. <laughs> I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I think it, it, it's really a conundrum because you find yourself in a situation where clearly it's being used by some of the um, most astute people in medicine, although there's definitely a valid argument against it. And so what I try to do is I put on the line what I know about Tamiflu, its pros and cons, and then if a parent really insists, then then I'll, I'll potentially bend and, and prescribe it for them. But I don't do it happily. I mean, my own daughter had had the flu about four weeks ago. And when she asked me about it, I said, you know, honestly, I don't think that it's worth your while. And I agree. You agree with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Certainly you'd use it with your own daughter. <laughs> now, qu quick review. Tamiflu is given twice a day for five days to treat or once a day at the same dose for 10 days to prophylax. Older kids and adults, each dose is 75 milligrams. And younger kids, 3 milligrams per kilo per dose, down to newborns, preemies, 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram per dose. If the oral suspension isn't available, you can open up the capsules and mix it with chocolate syrup or other sweet liquids. It bears repeating that you do not have to have laboratory confirmation to initiate antiviral treatment if you think it's indicated. And under five is considered by the CDC a high-risk child. So does an older child with the flu become high risk if they have a two-month-old baby brother at home or if their mother is pregnant, knowing that treating that child will decrease their viral load but not necessarily the total days of shedding? Prove to me that it will decrease their viral load. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's my point. I think, again, you have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm still really dubious about the effectiveness of Tamiflu. Last thing, what about prophylaxis? In a child you think has the flu, there's elderly people in the house or other high risk, and you know it's within 48 hours of contact. I, uh, I've prophylaxed a handful of high risk children who had siblings who had the flu. And so if I had a child who is an ex preemie and is, you know, you name it, you know, 18 months old or a child who is in remission from leukemia or anything along that lines, then my thought is, is that even though I don't have a tremendous belief in its effectiveness, uh, it, it's something that I would entertain as a possibility. And circling back to what we said before, those families that you prophylax, mm -hmm. was that a proven case that you got a flu test on or was it a clinically diagnosed by you? Some of each, actually. 
Good answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll split the hair that I'll way. I'll <laughs> say one last time, it's been a tough flu season, and some of these issues I think are just vexing for all of us, and it'd be nice to get some more data, like you said, about yeah. um, how effective it is. I mean, this is the last thing I'll say while I'm standing up on my soapbox, but with all the use of Tamiflu over the last 10 years, and it's been used a tremendous amount worldwide, you would think we would have better data on its effectiveness. And it's really disappointing to me. And to me, perhaps a little bit um, glaring in terms of the lack of proof that this is a medicine that despite the fact that we're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on it worldwide, that in my eyes at least has yet to be proven to be terribly worthwhile. That's all I've got to say about that. Perfect. We'll be right back with the Eagles. What a game. We will never forget this. Hopefully with joy in our hearts. Nine seconds left. Eagles by eight. Brady lines them up. He's back again. He steps up. He's hit. He stumbles. He is throwing it deep for the end zone. And it is batted around. And incomplete. And the game is over. The game is over. The Philadelphia Eagles. Super Bowl champions, Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Super Bowl 52. I went to the game in Minnesota, and Maddie Stayed at home. And later? Went to the parade. To the parade. Now, I did ask Matt to go, and didn't work out in his schedule, and- <laughs> Didn't work out in his budget, more like it. <laughs> And got really, two kids in college, man. <laughs> I gotta say, love doing this podcast, but it's because of this podcast that I went to the Super Bowl because one of our faithful listeners, which is uh, Jenna Elfman's dad in Madison, Wisconsin, texted me and said, "Hey, are the podcast pediatricians going to the Super Bowl?" And I was like, "Well, I'd like to if I can find someone." He's like, "Let's go!" And Madison, Wisconsin, is a four-hour drive from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he's from Philly, so. Flew out there, and we drove over. I took my underdog mask, wore it in the Chicago airport, and Minnesota was cold. It was reminded me of Chicago cold, minus 22 wind chill. Wow. And it was awesome. And the snacks were often, you know, they make uh, beer batter deep fried cheese curds. It's only about (laughs) 12,000 calories, but I got that wonderful Minnesota cuisine. at all that sounds healthy about that. (laughs) Briefly... The entertainment, I heard JT was doing halftime. I was so excited because I love James Taylor. But you know what, Matt? It wasn't James Taylor. I didn't get, like, when you went to Jacksonville to the Super Bowl, I think, would you get Bruce Springsteen? No, no, no. It was Paul McCartney. Still. So, you know, nice, n- nice entertainment. Thing. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, I got... Uh, uh, <laughs> Justin Timberlake's his name. <laughs> Justin Timberlake. But did get Leslie Odom Jr. from <laughs> Hamilton doing America the Beautiful and, of course, Pink. And then the game. Oh, my God. I mean, I don't know. But I guess at home, it was just unbelievable. But tense, back and forth and back and forth. What a classic game. Classic (sighs) game regardless, but certainly a classic game for the Super Bowl. Because we won. Oh, my God. Yeah, you notice that? You always call it classic when you win. Exactly. Like if the other guy won, it would be like, yeah, it was a good game. There were more yards Mm -hmm. gained in that game than in the history of all football, not just playoff football. Broke the record from 1950. And the one thing about being there, I mean, a lot of Eagles fans, but – the one thing, I don't know if you saw when you watched it on TV, is that I was right in the end zone where the Patriots kicker was practicing before, and he was terrible. He kept shanking it. I hmm. thought, like, he looks terrible. And then during the game, Were you the guy in the he dog was mask? terrible. I was one of the guys ah, in the dog mask. I, I was. I saw you. I was uh, photobombing everybody taking pictures. <laughs> nice. Much to the chagrin of Jenna Elfman's dad. <laughs> yes. um, but Does he actually have a name or he just goes by Jenna Elfman's dad? <laughs> Some call him Larry. I call him Jenna Elfman's dad. Nice. And uh, what's the one play to you which was the key play winning the Super Bowl? And I'll tell you mine. Oh, I I would absolutely have to go with Brandon Graham's strip sack. You know, that to me was just, oh, it was last minute and everything was so tense and things were not looking good for our Eagles. And all of a sudden, big time, big time Brandon Graham comes (sighs) through with the sack. It was amazing. I guess mine was, and that's probably in my top two, but mine was the fourth and two to Ertz Mm -hmm. on the last drive going on fourth down from their own 45. I mean, they don't get that. They don't win the game. Yes. 
Yeah, well, if you were at home, you would have had to listen to Chris Collingsworth completely massacre the oh. effort. Did you watch that after I came did watch home? it. He was oh awful. Oh, my gosh. Chris, give it up, awful. dude. He, he, had, like, he, had, he tipped three steps before he dove into the end zone. And of he, course he had possession. Get out with he, that. He kind of hated the Eagles from the yeah. start. I think he's like best friends with Tom Brady. But I got to say, a lot of you know, a lot more Eagles fans, but the Patriots, fan, Patriots fans, they were very gracious. As you got from Jacksonville, you really can't go mm-hmm. to the bathroom or eat anything because you you can't leave and come back. So the end right. of the game, starving, and everything's closed. So we end up going to a Chinese restaurant we found on Yelp. And we walked in. I was wearing my underdog mask and all Patriots fans. <laughs> oh. But they were like, hey, last year was our miracle. You guys were great. So it was, it was kind of nice. It was fun uh, coming home through the different airports and all these Eagle people. And you didn't even talk to them. You just kind of looked at them. You smiled and they smiled. But I came home. I did not get to go to the parade because I was working. So what was that like? Uh, the parade was uh, was electric. And, and, and I say that despite the fact that I stood in the same probably four by four square foot spot <laughs> for eight hours straight waiting for the Eagles buses to come by. But it was uh, it was just communal. You know, so many people uh, in Philadelphia had this mean so much to them, to their families, to the legacy of their families. It was just it was it was special. And there aren't a lot of things that I've been involved with. And nothing I've ever been involved with to that magnitude. There were, despite what you know, the various reports are, there were easily two to three million people there. And that to me was just, I mean, I saw the Pope in Philadelphia and that was an impressive crowd. But this was seemed to be twice that. And really just people were patient with each other. Nobody was acting like somebody who was there to ruin a day for anybody. It was just pure enjoyment and just reveling in what was really... A phenomenal victory. You heard it here. Matt said that the Eagles were bigger than the Pope. <laughs> I guess bigger than the Beatles also. Nice. Well, you didn't say much, which it was a really cold day for that parade. And didn't somebody get a flat tire? <laughs> oh, I didn't. T- yeah, okay. So I pick up my friend at about 4 a.m. to get to this parade. I pick up my brother at about 5.30 because he lives about an hour and a half away. And my brother lives about 10 minutes outside of Philadelphia, zipping across the Ben Franklin Bridge, only to encounter the biggest pothole I've ever seen, (laughs) in which case my front tire went zooming into it under the weight of our car, blew the tire. It was awful. I will say that when my wife tried to talk me out of AAA last year, I'm glad we stuck with it because that was a game saver that day. Really? Called AAA. They were out within 20 minutes, took my car off into the hinterlands of Philadelphia to get a new tire, and I was able to enjoy the parade. Went back and picked up the car a little bit later. Really happy to pay the $200 for a new tire because it was just such a great day. It's like, oh, uh, 200 bucks? Ah, yeah. sure, because what a great day. You know, worth every minute of it. And the star of the parade mm-hmm. speeches was? Yeah, Jason Kelsey put on Jason quite the show. Jason Kelsey in his mummer outfit. Yeah, came on looking like Aladdin uh, in green, <laughs> Aladdin's genie, and uh, and then just went on a what, what was a combination tirade and, uh, and, and revival in terms of just instilling in the Eagles fans a real sense of pride for what had been accomplished by the Eagles, particularly the Eagles who had been you know, downtrodden underdogs. It was it was quite the spiel, and uh, and it will be remembered in Philadelphia sports history fondly for decades. I've heard people say that they need to put a statue of him in that costume up <laughs> at the link. We'll plug a podcast called The No Huddle Show, which is all about the Eagles, if you're really into the Eagles, but I think that would be great. We need to have, we have a Rocky statue, we need to have a Jason Kelsey Mummer <laughs> statue for this season. So that's it for now. We'll be back soon with pets and then probably privates and prep so everyone out there if you're listening nice alliteration there man thank you Mm -hmm. if you're listening get your flu shots if anybody has any more it's not too late and we pray the flu season ends soon and we won't sing the whole song but let's just end up with the letters of the eagles ready e-a-g-l-e-s eagles Jeff Stoutland has had this in our building for five years. It's a quote in the old line room that has stood on the wall for the last five years. Hungry dogs run faster. And that's this team. Bottom line is, we wanted it more. All the players, all the coaches, the front office, Jeffrey Lurie, everybody wanted it more. 
And that's why we're up here today, and that's why we're the first team in Eagles history to hold that freaking trophy. And you know who the biggest underdog is? It's y'all, Philadelphia. For 52 years, y'all have been waiting for this. You want to talk about underdog? You want to talk about a hungry dog? For 52 years, you've been starved in this championship. Everybody wonders why we're so mean. Everybody wonders why the Philadelphia Eagles are, aren't the nicest parents. If I don't eat breakfast, I'm pissed off. No one wanted us. No one liked this team. No analysts like this team to win the Super Bowl. And nobody likes our fans. And you know what? I've just heard one of the best chants this past day. And it's one of my favorite and it's new. And I hope you all learn it. Because I'm about to drop it right now. You know what I got to say to all those people that doubted us, to all those people that counted us out, and to everybody who said that we couldn't get it done? What my man Jay and John just said. Podcast Pediatricians Productions. All rights reserved.